hello again, everyone. Pastor John here, and I'm here with my dear friend and brother, Tad. Um, if you're saying brother, you guys don't look anything alike. Well, we do in Christ. So. We're getting more and more looking alike. Yes, as we exactly. Get more and more like Jesus. Hopefully. So, um, Tad and I have had the privilege of serving together in ministry for, gosh, 30 years now, probably, give or take. And he's much older than me, which I would think is patently obvious. And um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, as those of you who've been taking our uh, Start to Follow class on Sunday mornings know, Tad filled in, to me, in for me this last week, and he taught on chapter six. The title of that chapter was Growing Pains, and it had to do with trials and temptations. And so we're just gonna continue that conversation and cover some more things in the manual. Uh, that I think will be really practical and helpful. The first thing uh, that I think uh, would be helpful for us to start off with is just the difference between uh, trials and temptations. Those are terms that are familiar that uh, a lot of people throw around and talk about. But uh, Tad, what do you see sort of the difference being between trials and temptation? Well, I, th I think I think I mentioned this actually on, on Sunday morning. I'm I can't remember what I said on Sunday morning exactly, but there, there's a difference, but then at the same time, there's a sameness, and it depends on the perspective you're looking at it from, I think. Um, I, I think, yes, there's a difference. A, a trial is something I think we tend to identify something that is there for our good, for our improvement, uh, for our growth. God would send a trial into my life uh, because he wants to accomplish something, or maybe he wants to just reveal something to me. I, you know, one of the toughest trials I think I ever uh, have heard of is where Abraham has to offer his son Isaac. Mm -hmm. That I can't even really imagine. And I have a pretty active imagination, but I can't imagine what that would be like. Right. Um, but that was from God. It was mm -hmm. God that said it, not Satan. Um, and it just... It's uh, an amazing thing to me how Abraham responds to that. Um, he just, it's like the next morning, okay, here we go, get the wood. Mm. <laughs> um, and God wanted to do that, not even necessarily to develop something in Abraham. I think I think he wanted Abraham just to, to make that decision, I'm going to believe God, I'm going to trust God. Because we know from Hebrews, Abraham thought, this is crazy. He promised Isaac, I guess maybe he's going he's gonna to raise him from the dead, I guess. <laughs> right. and, and, and God just said, there you go. See, you can trust. Yeah, you can trust me. And I think if I was Abraham, I wouldn't have even known I could trust God for something like that. I would have mm -hmm. thought, no, he could never ask me that. But now I know he can trust. Wow. Okay. That's great. So, but then a temptation, I guess, again, from the sender's perspective, it is, uh, it's to entice, it's to destroy, it's to get you to do something that you ought not do. And God doesn't do that. He says he won't do that. He promises he won't do that. Um, but Satan loves to do that. So in that sense, yeah, there's a difference as far as the intent. But from my perspective, I don't know that there's really that much of a difference. Because if I'm sent a trial by God, if God told me, take your only son and offer him, that would soon turn into a temptation <laughs> not to trust God <laughs> and to go my way because I think my way is way better because, you know, you promised him to me in the first place, so what are you doing? You're going against your word? Must not have been God. Must be bad pizza. So I that would be a temptation for me whether or not to believe God. So the same event, God sends it as a trial. Uh, it's a temptation, you know, or, yeah. or Satan sends me a temptation. Um, there's a... Uh, well, here's a real life example. Okay, uh, I don't know if I should say this. <laughs> no, I can say it. Um, I uh, our septic system failed years ago. I probably told you about this, mm -hmm. and uh, I could have fixed it very easily for like three thousand dollars. Just dig some more deep ditches because we have sand five feet down and would have drained. Would have worked for another thirty years. Cost us three thousand dollars. The county wouldn't let us do that. I went to the county. They said, "No, no, you have to have a pressure system." I remember this. It was yes. more like fifteen or twenty. It was eighteen and a half thousand yeah. dollars that I had to pay for that, and I didn't want to do it. And I just thought that is so stupid because I, ah, we dug a hole, and five feet down there's dirt and clay, and then five feet down it's like the beach. There's sand and big hole full of water, and all of a sudden the water goes down. It would have drained. It was fine, but. I would have to have signed a piece of paper, you know, if I sold the house, it says I didn't change my septic. I'd have to lie. And, you know, ah, I can't, I can't do that. Or my kids would have to. So I couldn't do that. So it was, it was, uh, 
in a sense, it was a temptation. Um, and I honestly feel like the enemy may have been involved in this because that thought of doing it for 3,000, I couldn't get rid of that thought. It was mm. so much more sensible. And I spiritualized it. God gave me this money and he wants me to be a good steward of it. He certainly doesn't want me to waste 15 and a half thousand of it, you know, to put in a pressure system that I don't even need, but I, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, and so that temptation, uh, became for me a trial. It became a test. Like, yeah. what am I going to do? Okay. You know what? It's really his money anyway. If he wants to waste fifteen and a half thousand dollars, that's up to him. <laughs> so if you really want to waste that much money, all right, God. And so we paid eighteen and a half thousand dollars. We have a nice three mound septic system in our field now. So I love it. So, but it 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 switched. You, yeah. you know, both th those things can so, switch. So, so it would be accurate to say uh, it really does depend on the perspective you're looking at. So, what God intends to test you, Satan intends to tempt you. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me because that is so consistent with what I've seen in Scripture in James 1, uh, 2 to 4, which I believe was mentioned in here. It talks about consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and, and so forth. What is interesting is in the original language of the Bible, it was the word for uh, test and, and tempt are the same word. Yeah. And, and so our English doesn't capture that nuance as, as much. Uh, it makes it look like they're two different, but they're the same word. And so I think it really does come down to what you've described. It's 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 how are you looking at it? I think it's also uh, something else that I've I've heard it said. You know, is that when it comes to tests, um, it really reveals what you're made of. And just like there are combustible materials that when they're tested or tried by fire, they, they just burn up. But other things are purified and strengthened like mm -hmm. precious metal or steel. And, and so uh, I think the Lord is obviously, you know, in the, in the business of purifying and refining and making us stronger. So I just think that that's an important um, thing to see in, in trials and temptation. Something else that I think is important, maybe we could kick this around a little bit. And, and you and I were talking about this a little while ago. And that is just the idea of um, how important it is to expect these things. I think a yeah. lot of times people are not either very realistic or, or very biblical. I'm talking about Christians, of course, uh, in, in how they approach life in a fallen world. And, um, and I think you probably agree with that mm -hmm. a little bit because yeah. we get surprised. It's like, God, why? And I can't yeah. believe I'm going through this trial or I can't believe I'm even being tempted like this. I'm a, I'm a Christian now and ha poof, why didn't my troubles just go away? Yeah, how could you do this to me? Look yeah. how faithful I've been. Or, you know, my kids are going through something, you know, that terrible thing and I raised them in the Lord. How could, how, you know, how could this happen to me? Yeah, and it's just, it's, it's a misunderstanding, I, th I think. Like any error we make is, it's a misunderstanding. Um, God... When he saved me, he did not make a deal with me that, hey, everything's going to get easier in your life from now on right. because you're, you're mine now. Oh, good job. You're worshiping me. You're, yeah, good, good. You, you're, 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 on a, you're on a great path. I don't need to do anything in your life to make you like Jesus. You're doing fine on your own. I mean, where, where, where does that idea come from? I mean, yeah. when he says, in this world, people who follow me, you will have tribulations. Exactly. You will have that. And so I think, you know, my experience with... Um, counseling, you know, you and I've counseled people for years. My, my experience is that when, when somebody is coming to something that is um, looking like they're going to hit the rocks, uh, it's not the situation itself. It's this expectation that how could this happen to me? That's what's, that's what's really eating at them. That's what is really disappointing them. And that's what uh, is making them so disillusioned is this God that I thought was for me apparently is not because he's letting this thing mm -hmm. happen. And when we look at the scriptures, though, and if we allow the scriptures to inform our view of this kind of thing, it, what, what we see is exactly the opposite. He does these things to produce in us the image of Christ, because that's, that's the only way, my, my belief is that's the only way he can really do it. Not because he's limited, but because I'm limited. I think of times where I've learned really important lessons, where I've had uh, pretty important changes in my thinking. And most of them, I mean, to be honest, the only ones I can think of are from some kind of a crisis, you know, that, that came into my life. Um, and this is what scripture tells us all the time, you know, that, that these trials, they're, they're, 
they're of a refining nature, you know, that, yeah, they produce patience, but not just patience, it produces character, God says, and character produces hope. And so that's, that's what he uses. And, you know, we talked about Romans a little bit. Um, Romans 8, 28, the verse everybody loves to quote, you know, all things, God works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. But the good, we think that we get to define the good. Yeah. And that's, keep reading. Keep reading. The, the thing about Romans 8, 28, it comes right before 8, 29. <laughs> and it says, because you were predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Mm-hmm. That's the good. Yeah. And so when I look at what he has used in the past to do that in my life and other lives, it's typically involving really tough stuff. Well, I think, too, that it's that Jesus didn't come to die to rescue us from any pain or suffering he he died to rescue us from judgment Mm -hmm. you know and ultimate eternal suffering separation which is separation from him but he allows short-term pain for long-term good and and i i think the bible is just replete with examples of people who suffered injustice of all types uh, and for different seasons yeah. Old Testament New Testament it does I mean just you can practically open your Bible and just put your finger down and there's probably somebody going through something that's there for an example for us that that just is again telling us what to expect realistically in this life the Bible is realistic but it's also hopeful and so it's not like, you know, you know, we, we're getting some uh, short end of the stick. Jesus said, "You know what? Expect this. This is this is part of the journey if you're going to become more like me." Yeah, and and doesn't any good parent do the same thing with their kids? Allow short term pain for long term benefit. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, allow your kids to sometimes experience the consequences of a bad decision, as long yeah. as it's not going to wipe them out. Or inflict some consequences yourself, some painful consequences of a bad decision mm. for long-term benefit. Natural consequences and logical and, consequences. And, and logical, imposed I tell people logical consequences are simulated natural consequences yes, yes. to speed up the learning curve yes. or simply preserve their life. Yes. <laughs> and, but any anybody who's been a parent for any length of time, sure. at least once they get to the toddler age, you know, knows this yeah. and, and why would we expect God to, to act any differently um, you know especially when you look all through the Old Testament with his people you know it's a, it's the same pattern uh, he would allow or even bring uh, difficult tri- trials painful circumstances into their life because that's the only time they would call out to him because they came to the end of their rope <laughs> okay so let me ask you this then in your own life um, and and I mean I didn't prepare you for this, but I, I'm confident you'll have a list of examples. Uh, so according to kind of this, these ideas that we're kicking around, can you think of an example in your life of something that initially you were like, God, why? This is terrible. This isn't fair. Only to later discover as you look back, oh, now I see why. And Okay, actually, that was good, yeah. and you now appreciate it, and you're thankful for it, and you 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 gained wisdom. You you know, can you think of um, maybe in a circumstance, maybe in a relationship, like what looked initially like a really bad idea, but later you said, God, okay, you're off the hook this time. It was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there've been several. I'm trying to think which ones I might have freedom to share. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, well, one that that I've certainly shared before, um, when I when I first got saved, um, I uh, there was a girl I liked a lot, loved, and we were together for about five years, um, and uh, you know everybody thought we were going to get married. Certainly, I did. Um, we talked about it, and I left college, uh, you know, because we were going to get married and go off into YWAM, and and then uh, she decided that that was not what she felt like God wanted her to do, and it was a very huge shock to me and surprise um and i had you know we had a lot of mutual friends and i talked to some people and just pray for me because i don't know what to do with this and they were like i don't know i don't know what's going on but um and it was just a i just thought god how could you do this i mean you know we were like one of the great couples that you could say hey kids if you're gonna 
you know, be Christian couple, be like them. <laughs> I mean, and I just thought, what, what, how could this, how could this not happen? And it didn't. And it took me a while. It took me the whole summer to get over it. Um, I had a little temper tantrum at God and, and then I just kind of realized, well, okay, God's God, and I guess he's got something else. So I decided, okay, well, clearly he doesn't want me to get married ever. So I had a whole new plan for my life that you know I was ready to, ready to do. And long story short, I went on with my life. She went on with her life. Um, I wound up meeting uh, this girl in college. I went back to finish college, and we wound up, after five years dating, we got married. And I... Girl number one is a wonderful girl. You know, I would have had a wonderful life with her, I'm sure. But girl number two, I can't imagine living mm-hmm. life without Kay. I cannot. We would have none of the kids that we have. They'd, they'd, I mean, I, I would have had kids, but not these kids. I just can't imagine the world without these kids. Right. They're just, they're wonderful. They, uh, uh, yeah, so... Anyway, I was so sure that that had to have been a mistake. She had to have been making a mistake. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. God knew exactly what he was doing. But, you know, and I even thought, I thought everything worked together for good. I remember thinking that, you know, just taking that to the throne, you know, Mm -hmm. this is not good. And it was good. It was Mm -hmm. totally good. And she married a wonderful guy. And they had a bunch of kids. And none of those kids, you know, would be alive. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I there's just so many things that um, have happened, you know, some with people, some not with people that I've just, looking back, I've learned something that I knew in my brain, but it it got it down into my heart. You know, you know, I've, you know, the migraines for years, I had migraines at 1.3 a week, which meant really I was only getting three nights of sleep a week. And I was Mm -hmm. awake for three or four nights a week without sleep. And I just thought, I can't go on like this, you know? I, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I mean, obviously I had to go on. Um, I had kids, <laughs> I had a wife, and um, and then he, uh, just through a variety of circumstances, he worked it out so that I went from three a week to one a month, but he never took them away. He never took them totally away. And I would not ever wanna go through all that again, but I learned from that that this too shall pass and that in no way is this condition in any way reflective of what he feels about me. And I learned from that in a way that I knew in my head, but difficult times are going to come to an end. They are. And I just thought about that. I thought, well, of course they are. Everything is. Every trial, if my whole life is a trial, if I wind up in solitary confinement and being starved to death, my life is a trial and it will end. I'll be with him one day in heaven. And I guess the migraines just taught me to know that in my heart as well as my head because every migraine eventually did end. So, you know, it's 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 so true. I remember, you know, when and it's been a long time ago now. I mean, I sometimes I, I can hardly believe 20 years have gone by. But uh, when when I went through cancer, I just remember um, literally you talk about things that go through your mind. I remember listening to the diagnosis with these two doctors that had been working hard for two weeks to try to figure out what it was that was going on in my body. And they just, I remember them walking in and they were so forlorn and, and sad. You know, they're looking at this young guy, 33 years old with his wife and their four babies. And well, they weren't there, but Tiffany and I were there. And, and I just remember they weren't in tears, but they, they looked like, they could be, you know, they were just trying to be sort of resolute and strong and tell me what I needed to know. And, and I just remember they made the announcement that I had cancer, that I had leukemia and, um, and the Lord spoke to my heart in that moment and just said, John, I'm just as much in control of your life in this moment as I've ever been. And you're just, you're just going to, be more aware of that, you know, and, and it was so comforting to me because like we were talking about earlier, trial, God allowed, but, but my natural inclination was to instantly be plunged into this temptation to, to be afraid, to panic, to freak out. But it was like this restraining mercy of the Lord, this ministry of the Holy Spirit, just say, and, and he was bringing truth to bear truth about his character, 
and his track record of faithfulness. Yeah. And it was like, it just calmed me and it, it gave me peace and so that it, it was a test of faith. Now, I don't always pass those tests, but I find because of the faithfulness of God, in the course of time, I do, mm -hmm. you know, because he enables me to do that because I'm his, my heart belongs to him. My life belongs to him. And so, but there are hard lessons to be learned, sometimes heartbreaking things that it does, you know, it doesn't take hours or days or weeks. Sometimes it, it's, it can take years of, of something that you just, it, it's like, it's just kind of, I don't know, it just stretches you so far beyond what you ever imagined. Yeah. But yet you do you do see in the course of time, it's like God sort of surprises you with his grace and his mercy in the moment, mm -hmm. you know, and and every every special moment now, like big moments, like as a dad walking, you know, one of my daughters down the aisle or, you know, like today, I'm splashing a little kiddie pool with my first grandson, you know, they're just precious moments to me. And, and I, and I, and it's, it's there because God on purpose took me through a trial, you know, that, forged his character and proved his faithfulness so that today I look back and I go, oh, it makes me even more grateful. Yeah. It makes me even more grateful for life because I realize now I know not every story ends <clears throat> in sure. a happy way. I totally get that. But in the moment, I didn't know that we were going to, yeah. he was going to heal me. Yeah. I, I did not know that was purely in God's hands in the moment for two and a half years of moments like that, it was one test after another that I, I just, they're, they're, you know, I, I'm grateful now 20 years later, but I'm just saying in the midst of that two and a half years, it, it felt like it was moment by moment sometimes. And I'm not saying that to make a big deal of me. I'm, I'm saying it to make a big deal of God because it was just, right. it was just his mercy, you know, it is interesting, the element of time you, you mentioned, as time goes on, it seems like it gets easier somehow. I wish I could, I wish I could short circuit that somehow. I wish time wasn't necessary. I, I think it's for us, not for him, obviously, that mm -hmm. it's necessary. Um, I know it's easier for me to respond with trust now than it was 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, I know, I knew things about God that he was trustworthy. The first verse I ever memorized and I don't remember why I memorized it maybe somebody told me but I just think I just felt like I should memorize this verse is trust in the Lord with all your heart and mm -hmm. all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths and I just thought I think I'm going to need that because <laughs> because it's part about don't real don't lean on your own understanding but in all your ways acknowledge him I, I'm going to need that I just mm -hmm. somehow knew I was going to need that and I have needed that um but it's it has gotten easier from time and but there's nothing magical, I think, about time. I think what happens is as time goes by, we just see time and time again, he, pro he does prove faithful and things do work out. And because time gets stretched out, we say, oh yeah, it did work out. You know, it took a while for me to see that my not marrying that girl was not a disaster because look at all these other things. It, it took time right. for me to see that. Of course, God saw it from the get-go. I mean, that was his plan from the get-go. But I, I wish there was a way somehow I could acquire that, you know, without all the time. And I'm, I don't think there is, except it, maybe it speaks to the necessity of the body of Christ coming in and people surrounding and, and carrying one another's burdens and reminding us, reminding each other of the fact that he is faithful. Um, you know, telling stories of his faithfulness that maybe, you know, I've seen, but you haven't seen, just to help encourage, to help that message just settle in and settle in so it helps me or it helps that person respond more in faith because they're surrounded by evidence of prior acts of faith. Well, and growth and growth takes time. It, yeah. And, and God just doesn't seem to be in a hurry <laughs> the way we are. And, um, but like he, he wants there to be, what's that, what's that? 
Would you rather the squash? The, the squash, the yeah, yeah. yeah. The if you want to grow, six, a, if you want to grow a squash, uh, if you want to grow an oak, it'll take take a hundred years. years. If you want to grow a squash, it'll take about three months. You want to be an oak tree or a squash? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it, it's so true. But I, yeah, boy, that's a good point, Dad. T- time, time is uh, something that from our view of things it it just seems like it stands still or it drags on yeah but you know even a little acorn that falls and it kind of produces this little tiny oak tree and it's only about a foot tall and it grows next to the other oak tree it can look up and see that big oak tree (laughs) and know that ah someday yeah and that maybe that's the role we can have for each other i i know uh actually recently for me um a couple years ago well what was it when i uh went to teach full-time three or four years ago. I can't remember, four years ago, whenever it was. Um, I just felt like this is what the Lord wants me to do. So I, I went to teach full-time um, and did that for a couple of years. And then just through circumstances, uh, that job was no longer mine. And so I was like, okay, now what? You called me to teach full-time and it didn't work out here for you know some good reasons. And now what? Mm-hmm. And it did, and I, I knew what he called me to do, that I was supposed to teach uh, high school. And I looked around, and there was just no opportunity here, you know, in, in Thurston County to do that. Or in Tacoma, because they said, oh, that sounds great, but we're full now. Um, and I just thought, and, but the weird thing is, I wasn't stressed about it, because I have seen him. And I didn't know what he was going to do, but I just thought, okay, well, we'll just see. Maybe I'll just kind of teach junior high for a little while until something comes. You know, I, I don't know. And then lo and behold, I find out that there's a brand new high school starting up and they're desperately in need of a teacher. And, they're, you know, and, and when it happened, it was almost like, oh, okay, there's the ram in the thicket. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of, that was kind of my reaction in a, in a sense that would not have been my reaction you know, when I was 35. Um, I would have been freaking out. I got a family. What, we, uh, what am I going to do? But, um, well, what happens is over time, your you know, theory becomes experience. Yeah. You, know, you, you learn these truths from the God's word. But then it's like, okay, we're going to actually live this, you know. And and I'm grateful that he does put people in our lives that are further down the trail than us because it helps me to watch you and and others and say, okay, they have their own unique experience of trials in life, but they're obeying the same God. They have the same faithful God. They're reading the same word of God and they're they're working out these same principles of truth in their lives and man it just it it, I call it seeing Jesus with skin on you know when you the body of Christ looks sometimes like my brother and sister that I go okay if if they if they can trust God then I can too and ultimately I know you know I, I I need to just trust I need to take God as word but God's so gracious like he I think it's so awesome that he didn't just give us the Bible. He gives us each other. Yeah. And 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 just like in the scripture there are good examples and bad examples and we can learn from both and we should. There are there, there are those those people in life, you know, that we go there's a good example, there's a bad example. I'm going to learn from both. Yeah. And um so what are some of the things that what would you say some of the <clears throat> the the greatest truths from God's word are for you personally when dealing with trials and or temptations. So there's certain just sort of go to passages. You mentioned one in in uh, Proverbs three, but what other? Yeah, there are. Well, there's a couple actually, and I think we uh, I think I, I probably mentioned them both on Sunday. But uh, one, well, we've already talked about Romans chapter eight. That's for me. That's huge um, because obviously, when I encounter a trial, it's a trial because I don't think it's very good what's happening. <laughs> it's difficult, mm-hmm. um, but that verse tells me that God is at work and He's using all things mm-hmm. to work them all out for the good, and He's using the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I know that because in Romans chapter eight, if you read it. It talks about a lot of really bad things in that chapter. You know, when he a little bit later he says, "What is going to separate us from the love of God?" Right. You know, famine, try, you know, all these things, terrible things, dying, people dying. No, so it's not like Paul forgot what bad things were like when he was writing that chapter. Yeah, and so he he had that in in mind. The Holy Spirit had that in mind when when he was speaking that, and to to realize that okay, it is going to work out for the good. I am going to become more like Jesus. That gives me a staying power. The other one is. Um, maybe even more uh, 
concrete in a, in a way, not quite as conceptual. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 10, he says, there's, well, he, again, this word that means the same thing, temptation and trial. Mm-hmm. Some, you know, you read some translations, it'll say temptation, others will say test, but mm-hmm. there's no temptation or no test that overtakes you except what's common to man. But God is faithful and he will, with that temptation or test, provide a way of escape Ah, oh, and you think, good, I can get out of it. You know, it's the American way, right? Get out of it. But no, he goes on, a way of escape that you may be able to bear up under it. Mm. Or I think NIV says that you may be able to endure it. So obviously I'm not escaping it. Right. What I'm escaping is I'm escaping being shipwrecked by it. I'm escaping it destroying me. Mm-hmm. And so I am going to receive grace. He's going to provide a way of escape from being defeated. And I'm going to be able to bear up under it. And people are going to be able to see that. They're going to have their faith built. So... That's a very practical thing for me because unless he's a liar, any time I have a temptation or a trial and it seems, oh, too much, it's not too much. Yeah. He says, I will provide a way of escape that you can endure it, that you mm-hmm. can bear up under it. So I just look for that way. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of um, a uh, uh, years ago, I think I shared this Sunday too, but I was uh, watching, uh, or not watching, listening to Larry Burkett's show. Um, and they had somebody on from a, a, an Asian country. I don't remember who it was. And they were just talking about Christianity in Asia, Christianity in America. And the interviewer said, so what are differences that you see between the church in your mm. country and the church in America? What's a, what's a good difference and what's mm-hmm. a bad difference? And he said, well, in America, the good is you have so much energy. You have so much energy um, and, and you're so helpful to people. You know, you give and you do all these things and you make these things happen. You have these ministries all over the world. There's just this spiritual energy. That you, you get a lot done and that's wonderful. And in my country, sometimes we're just tired. You know? <laughs> but the bad thing he said was, well, in, uh, in my country, when we encounter difficult trials and, and situations, we pray and our prayer is, Lord, grant us the grace to endure this. And in America, it seems like the typical prayer in the church is, Lord, get me out of here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the interviewer goes, that is very true. <laughs> and, oh, was the, it, is it the old Excedrin or Buffer? We haven't got time for the pain. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. kind of a yeah, yeah. typical American and, mindset. And, and pain is bad. And even, even uh, oh, the New Atheists, you know, they wrote all their books attacking Christianity. And and it was interesting to read them because, of course, they have to borrow from Christianity because just the, even the idea of good, yeah. you know, what is, how are you going to measure it? Well, one of the guys, he measures good by the greatest uh, happiness for the greatest number of, of people. And I just thought that's so American, happy, mm-hmm. happiness, you know. And I just think of all the times that I inflict unhappiness on my children for a a benefit down the road for athletes I coach in mm-hmm. track I inflict great unhappiness on them during the you know workouts wind sprints or yeah, yeah for a benefit down the road yeah and we should know better but we just yeah. we we miss the connection when it comes to our spiritual life there's a scripture that that just has meant the world to me very similar idea to what you were talking about in Romans 8 2 Corinthians 4 um classic passage where the apostle paul is you know he he's talking about all the hardships in his life and this treasure that we have in earthen vessels we we have the gospel and we we have um you know this this message for the world and um and uh, the centerpiece of this message is the fact that our suffering um is not without purpose. Jesus died, but he also conquered death and rose again. And our lives, you know, we get to proclaim this message. We get to live this message. And he talks about all of these things. Paul says, we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, yet not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And it's so inspiring to read Mm -hmm. that because it's like he just keeps coming back up and saying, no, because of Jesus and and His power and everything He did, like you know, these our worst day isn't the end of the story, right? Yeah. And then He gets to the end, <clears throat> and these are the verses that just really the Lord ministered to me during that trial I was describing earlier. He says, uh, "Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment." is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 
while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Yeah. And there's just so much there, but just this idea that that there's a spiritual work underway and whatever happens in our temporary circumstances or our physical body it's just that it's temporary but there's a greater thing happening and very much like romans 8 28 where it says all things work together paul is saying here you know the these light affliction and i'm thinking good grief paul light affliction you know there's just in this very book he starts out by talking about these things that that in the moment caused him to despair of life like yeah. they were just so hard but he says it's a light affliction and it's momentary and it's working for us so all of those things put together you're like yeah. okay this you know in the light of eternity this is this you and know that's the, and that's the key it's light because it's being compared to something that is eternal so exactly way way heavier it's it, it's it's momentary because it's being compared to something that's eternal yeah <laughs> and how could it not be light how could it not be momentary and to quote my friend a tall friend <laughs> What view do we take, Tad? <laughs> we take the long view. <laughs> and 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 we remember above all things God wants us to be happy, right? <laughs> yeah. You bet. <laughs> that's that's what my Bible says. <laughs> ah. No, that's, it does not say that. Yeah, I it's it's uh and again, these things they're th- this is why it's so important to be in the word because when we get catapulted into these difficult situations sometimes through no fault of our own sometimes partly through our own fault mm-hmm. but not always you just get so caught up in what's going on around you and god is in the picture and the word reminds me of that and it it helps me to just not think of things in a self-centered way but you know i, I read passages like that and it just reminds me of reality and that's why the body we need to remind each other you know that one of my other sayings that I, I love is don't ever doubt in the dark what you knew was true in the light mm. nothing's changed the mm. eternal truth of god's word hasn't changed it's just my perspective has changed and i love <coughs> the uh david is a fascinating character to me uh in some ways i can't relate to him he's just like Doo, up and down and i'm just like eh, boring but <laughs> he I, I love some things that he did when the thing with him and goliath i've talked about this before you know when you read that story and he's going to fight Goliath, this like nine foot tall giant, he is cocky. I mean, he's <laughs> saying cocky stuff. Like, yeah. who are you, you uncircumcised Philistine dog? You know, <laughs> I mean, the Lord God gave me the lion and the bear. You don't have a chance, you know? I, I got five stones. I only need one for you. The rest are probably good for your brothers. Where are they? You know, I just, right. I, it's just crazy how confident this guy is. But when you look at what he's saying, he's re- he's referring to God, hmm. and he sees get Goliath there. He's big, yeah. yeah. He could crush me like a bug. But it's not God, a self confidence; it's a it's God a, confidence. God's in the yeah. picture. He yeah. sees God in the picture, and when God's in the picture, Goliath is really small. He's temporary, you mm-hmm. know. He's light <laughs> mm-hmm. because God is in the picture. And when we get in a dark spot, we can't see God very well, and so we just need to stay in the Word and have people remind us He's there. He hasn't gone. He's the same as He's always been. Well, and to your point, that this verse also is is really important because what, the point you're making about being in the Word, I think one of the things that has made all the difference for me, and I know it has for you as well, um, is. I think, I think, I, I wish I could, I wish more people would understand it's not enough to just read the Bible. You have to meditate yeah. on the Bible. You have to, you have to, you have to think deeply and, and ponder the truth and let it get into your, into your soul and, and, and then you need to do it. It's not enough even to, just to meditate, but you've got to actually do it. And with obedience, God gives more revelation and more understanding, but part of the meditating process for me is actually looking up the meaning of words. And what is interesting, I'm just reminded as I was listening to you, this word look, where he says we look, we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. That word look is interesting in the Greek language is the word skopeo. It's where we get our word scope. And, And you talk about a picture and talk about focus. Like we we don't just glance at eternal things, but like we have to 
look through this eternal lens. We have to focus. Just like if you're looking through a scope on a, on a hunting rifle, yeah. you've got to dial in and, and really see God and see God's promises, God's character, God's ultimate plan. Like you have to really look and stay focused on that because as we get easily distracted. If we start looking at physical things, temporal things, then we're not looking at Jesus anymore yeah. and his promises and his character. And so we lose heart, you know, and, and we end up doing things in unbelief rather than in faith. I'm going to let you have the last word on that. No, I, I agree. I just think, I don't know that this verse means this, but when you're talking, it makes me think of it, you know, how he says, now we see through a glass darkly. And mm -hmm. I know I've looked through some dark glasses and what do you do? You put your eye right up to it and you just, you let your eye adjust to it. And you, you don't just, oh, I can't see it, I go away. But you just, and then I, I go like this sometimes back and forth to see what am I really seeing there? And in a way that's like, I take the word, I kind of do that because I'll just read it and I have my initial sight. Yeah, it's just a piece of dark glass. I have something there, but I can't really see what it is. But I just, you keep looking, and then you can kind of see a little bit more, and you can kind of see a little bit more. And I'm not saying that glass darkly thing means that. It's talking about how our vision is obscured. Mm -hmm. But it is obscured, and I don't have perfect understanding of things. Mm -hmm. So I do. I have to I have to study it. I have to think about it. i got to put my name in there, you know, when I'm yeah. going through, you know, uh, love is patient, love is kind. No, Tad is patient. Tad is kind. Oops, kind. Ah, better work on that one. That's mm -hmm. not ringing true today. Mm -hmm. And I just, you have to just think and stop and you can't, yeah, you, you can't just gloss over it. That's not what it's meant yeah. for. So, Well, good talk, Tad. Um, I don't know, you know, that we covered every single thing in that chapter by any means, but I think it the purpose of, of these conversations is to sort of whet the appetite to say, hey, you know, it's we're not just filling in blanks, you know, in a little workbook. We're actually processing God's word together in real life. And uh, I hope that it's encouraging to people who are watching and listening. I know I get encouraged when I sit down and talk, uh, you know, together with with my brothers and sisters in Christ and, and just share life, you know, see not only how our story's unfolding, but, you know, more importantly than, than anything else, that Jesus is the hero of our story. And, and by being in the Word and processing it together, um, this is what it means to follow. To follow, not just start to follow, but to continue following Jesus. And, and this is what it means to be a disciple and, and to make other disciples is these kinds of conversations that I look back over the years and I realize, and I wouldn't be who I am, where I am, without the Tad Sowers in my life and um, and others, and and so uh, it's it 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 really does make all the difference. So uh, we hope you've been blessed by listening in on this conversation, and uh, we have one more class uh, on Sunday, and uh, encourage you to come at the nine o'clock hour, and um, and we'll finish strong, and uh, hopefully this has been something encouraging. Uh, to your faith this week as you walk with Jesus. So God bless you, and we'll see you this Sunday.